Good afternoon. Today we're joined by Aaron Parrish, Deputy City Administrator from the City of Rochester. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role, and the City of Rochester? Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here today. Really looking forward to the opportunity of just talking to people about what serving and local government's all about. Um, I am currently the city uh, with the City of Rochester, and I'm their Deputy City Administrator. And so, in short, I'm kind of the uh, the second in command uh, for our city as an organization. We have over 900 employees, and we are engaged in all the things that people might be familiar with: economic development police, fire, public utilities, public works, community development, building safety, any number of different things that you'd expect a city to be involved with. Um, my particular role, in addition to just working on general government with our legislative affairs, our capital improvement plan and budget, I also really spend a lot of my time working on Destination Medical Center and so it's our, our big economic development initiative. I'm kind of the city face of that and work actively with our teammates that support uh, the Destination Medical Center initiative. Um, in addition, I support our development services and infrastructure team. And so that's public works, community development and building safety. And so I really uh, spend a lot of my time uh, focused in those areas. Excellent, so uh, we're in October uh, is when we're, we're having this interview. I know you guys are, are coming up on the budget cycle. Why don't you talk a little bit about what city budgeting looks like uh, in normal years? And obviously this year is a little less normal. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that looks like and uh, what, what people might expect if they get in a role like that? Yeah, so, you know, really our budget is the most important policy setting exercise we go through in a given year. It really determines what we're going to spend our money on, which is a reflection of our values as a city in terms of what we find to be important. So we really work to facilitate a good process with our mayor and city council so they can have their values reflected in the services we provide to the residents of Rochester. Um, we go through a fairly extensive internal process. Our budget's over $500 million. And so, you know, we want to be very intentional with how we go about investing that and over $100 million of that is in capital improvements. So things we invest into the community, whether it be work on our airport or roads or cool spaces in our downtown, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can make those capital investments uh, important for our community, but also leverage other money. So we spend a lot of money locally, um, but of that $500 million budget, only 70 million of that is coming from our property taxpayers. The rest is federal grants, user fees like you pay on your electric bill and any number of different things. So we have a base level of services we try to provide. And then every year we look at what are some of those things we might want to enhance. Now this year is totally different um, with the COVID impact. We actually have had to find ways to reduce our budget by $26 million. So we've held on a number of vacant positions. So it's a strategy for us this year about how we can we preserve the core and still help our community to respond to the pandemic. Excellent, that's, I mean, it's really interesting the idea that the budget is a, a reflection of the values of the city and the elected officials. You gave a few examples of what you would see with that, but why don't you talk a little bit more in depth about exactly what you mean by that reflection of the values? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, city government really isn't more complicated than your personal budget. I mean, people a lot of times want to make it feel that way, but if you spend a lot of your money about going to the movie, out to the movies, like that's a value for you and it's a reflection of what you do. So um, for us, I mean, for example, in our general fund, which is our core services, you know, we spend um, over half of that budget on public safety. So as a community, we value public safety and we invest in it. And so, you know, we have over $30 million we spend on police uh, services and, and fund our law enforcement that way. And a similar, you know, strong investment in firefighting and ability to respond to medical emergencies. So 
you know, each year we judge that out and say, you know, are those still priorities? Are they still important? And do we want to continue investing? And then we, we do that for every service that we provide. And at the end of the day, if we're not investing in it and can't, you know, ultimately deliver, it's not a, as big of a priority. So it's a number of many, 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 many individual decisions um, that we make that in turn reflect those priorities, but strong priorities for us in public safety. Um, we also have some really strong priorities though in terms of just trying to make Rochester a quality of life. And I would just say one thing that we take very seriously is what are our strategic priorities and foundational principles? And we lens all of that, what we do through those. So we have foundational principles on public safety, social equity, um, sustainability, and others. We have strategic priorities and really ensuring a strong quality of life, managing our infrastructure investment, and, many, and a couple of others. So we run all of our you know, policy making through those priorities and try to judge, are we living up to that? Or what can we do to help advance in those areas? Excellent. So one of the things I think that, that high school students and, and students in general would be interested to know is, how does somebody get to a role like deputy city administrator? What's the path? What did your high school career uh, look like? What did you take in college if you went to college? How, how did that go? Yeah, so, you know, I think the cool thing about what I do is I don't do the same thing on any given day. I'm involved in so many different things. So I think What's interesting about that is you can come to local government in a role like mine or a city administrator or someone that works in city management from a lot of different backgrounds. My, my boss, the city administrator, used to be a parks director and started that way, but learned local government through the lens of parks and recreation. I started um, with a focus on economic development and worked my way through a track where, you know, I worked on economic development and then translated that into city management. So um, I'll be honest with you, Mike, I was not the most prolific high school student. I graduated in the bottom third of my high school class, which is not necessarily meant to um, instill, you know, be a good reflection. But at the same time, I think it shows you that high school is a point in time. It's what a lot of times it's what you do after high school that's important. So I went from graduating, you know, in the bottom third of my high school class to the top 2% of my college class. So I you know, blossomed a little bit later than some and prioritized my education at a little bit different time than some. Um, so I would just say for me personally, I went to Hamlin um, and got my undergraduate degree there, but because I didn't do as well in high school, I actually started off in community college. Graduated with an undergraduate degree in political science. I am not a political person. I work in a political environment, but I'm not political. And it's good for me to understand that, but I also understand the process of how government works and learn that through my education. Um, really position myself well for my future career though, also through internships. I did an internship with two different cities, a parks district and the legislature. So internships were an important part of my learning experience. And then I also, before I actually entered the workforce, went and got a master's degree focusing on city management, economic development. So that's the educational side. And then from there, I accepted a position in local government, um, working as an economic development coordinator, turned that into a department head role with the city as a community development director, and then uh, ultimately uh, landed my first job when I was 28 as a city administrator in a smaller community, moved up to the next largest community, and now I've been in Rochester for almost three years. So, you know, that's one progression is to kind of start move around through a handful of different positions. There are some others though that start in one organization and work all the way up. Excellent. So one of the things you talked about is some of the different classes you took and some of the things you learned, but then the value of internships. Why don't you talk about those internships and what those meant to you as you move forward in your career? Yeah, so I didn't really start my internships until I was a junior in, in college, um, which was, you know, kind of a normal time. I was trying to judge out exactly what I want to do. I mean, I'm just to be honest, most people don't wake up and say, I want to be a deputy city administrator for my career. You know, that's just not a normal thing for, you know, someone that's younger or even in high school to be thinking about. Um, I was thinking about law school. I was thinking about a variety of other things. 
um, and focus more on that. But then I started learning about city government while I was in college. And I was like, this is cool. I can have a very intentional and meaningful impact at the local level and see what I do and the results of that, as opposed to sort of, you know, working in a different space where I might not really get to see the full picture of what's going on in the government I'm serving. Um, internships were very helpful in helping me sort of narrow that down because when I started my first internship with the legislature, I thought maybe I want to do something political and I learned some skills there. Um, I worked for a park district through college and then I was able to do an administrative internship there and started to feel better about that and say, well, you know what, I really want to work in the non-political part of, of government and serve and provide services, innovate. And um, at that time, I was starting to kind of take that in, and, and there was a movement about government innovation, which, you know, I was reading books on that and, you know, coming up in my schooling, and it was very exciting to me. And so I just kept building on that. We had people come in and started to acquaint me with city government, but, and then I was able to leverage that in, and when I was in grad school and got accepted to a program where most of the city managers in the state were coming out of at Minnesota State University in Mankato, um, another big program in Minnesota is at Hamlin where I went to undergrad and really just started to get that idea that if I wanted to be innovative, you know, city management and economic development was more the area where I would have that opportunity to, to innovate and to, to work on projects that were meaningful at the community level. But I learned so much about what it is to work in city government and what it is and what, it, and what the, the good and the bad and where I had opportunities to change. I also got mentors out of the out of that experience where I long term then had people I could draw upon for knowledge and insights, but also recommendations which are very important in helping you get your first job. Excellent. I mean, that's great information, especially one of the things that people don't normally think about is the value of mentors. And, you know, you talked about the fact that you got mentors through uh, your internships and, and different things you did. If somebody was looking to uh, start generating relationships with some people that could give them uh, insight into what they're looking to do, whether in your career or something else, what would your suggestion be about finding those mentors? Yeah, I, I really think most people in most professions, you know, are, are open to providing feedback about, you know, what it is in my, you know, what is, what is it that I do and why is it, you know, excite me and, and how do I, you know, keep, keep, you know, on providing, you know, service. And so, you know, I think just kind of go to where folks are at. Um, I mean, obviously, once you get into college, they have more structured programs about connecting you with people that might have gone there and are interested in your pathway. But just directly reaching out, I talk to students all the time about my work um, and, and what, you know, what's interesting about it and, and what they need to do if, they're, if it's something that they wanna pursue. Um, there are internships out there, maybe not as much at the high school level, but definitely for those as you start to get into college, it's a, a, a real good way for you to assess if this is something that, that's a fit for you. But I think relying on advisors um, in college, your professors oftentimes will have, you know, strong connections. But in local government too, you're, you live in a community, so you have the opportunity to absorb it. You can participate in community events. We in Rochester, um, and while my family lives in Casson, um, we in Rochester have a youth commission. So if you know there's opportunities in your city government that way, um, but even just attending. Um, you know, a council meeting to understand like, what does that look like? And, and what does that mean? Or a park board meeting or anything that might be interesting to you are all ways where you can just sort of informally educate and start to develop those experiences. So advancement is a little bit different in uh, the role that you have than it is in other places. So you know, let's talk a little bit about your career path, uh, how you came in and how you, how you made the decision to go the direction that you did and get to be a city administrator. Yeah, you know, I, uh, again, I, I was interested in city management while I was in college. I, you know, focused that, you know, in my career program, but 
you know, didn't make the decision until I'd been in the profession or in working in local government about four or five years until I really accepted that first route and your first position in city management. I went to a, actually a smaller community in Northwest Minnesota. I had to move my young family. Um, I have a spouse who's also, you know, an educator and, and had to relocate, you know, her. But really it was an opportunity for me to accept that first position, my first opportunity um, to work within community leadership in a more, you know, significant way. And I learned a ton of things by doing that. I learned how to have a good staff council partnership. I learned the kinds of things that it takes to, to, to lead and develop and build a team because right now I'm more in a role where it isn't about the projects I work on day to day. It's about how I mentor and lead others through and, and really coach them through, um, you know, the work that they're doing. I mean, I'm fortunate now where, you know, I have a team of, of 13 people that report directly to me and, and I get to mentor them in terms of how they can provide service and how they can grow where they're at. So it is a journey where you start working on you know, things that are very much more specific to yourself. And then you're kind of going through and, and figuring out how do I lead people and how to provide leadership um, within the community and within my organization. Um, I just say it's a ri there's risk, right? Like, you know, at times to do what I do, you have to take risks. You work in a very public facing environment at times. And you know, a lot of people will second guess the decisions that you make. And at the end of the day, you just have to be grounded enough in your experiences and in your character and in your integrity to say, I'm comfortable making this recommendation. Um, and I always tell people that work on my teams, you don't have to, um, if there was a right answer for everything, we wouldn't need a city council. The city council gets to provide and inflect the values into our decision making process. So um, I think there's, there's, it's risk. Um, for me personally, I, you know, it's, it's required me to re move and relocate my family a few times, which is very challenging as your kids um, get older. Um, but I will say my kids have done a great job of adapting. Um, and, and I just think it's taking those risks and having confidence in yourself. I think there's a lot of people out there that always wait for everything to be perfect, um, women in particular. And I think if you're willing to sort of take a risk and be halfway there or three quarters of the way there are ready, I think you're ready. And so I think that risk taking piece is, is highly underrated for folks. So let's talk a little bit about team building. You, you mentioned that is something that is specific to what you're doing right now. Let's, let's talk about what your thought process is as you put a team together. And then I, uh, and then I also want, uh, so let's talk about how you put a team together. And then I also want you to talk a little bit about what it looks like to uh, work with the council. So basically that, that different level of government that kind of directs what you do. Yeah. Well, I would just say I'm, I'm building teams. It's so important. And, you know, ultimately um, we are multidisciplinary. We have on a project, you know, a perspective from engineering to public safety to, you know, any number of just more of administrative kinds of things to think about. And, and when you're looking at it, it's always good to assess, like what are the needs of this particular outcome and who are the people that can help us get there? So, you know, at the front end, obviously thinking about, you know, the right mix uh, for people on a team, super important. But in terms of making that team successful, I'm really focused and really a big believer in, in strengths-based, you know, leadership. And so I really try to focus in on where are this individual strengths? How can it contribute to their success and how can it contribute to the team's success? And so we actually go through and spend a fair amount of time trying to understand each other as a team, whether that's through assessments and in terms of understanding people's personality, what their strengths are. But probably more important, and I've got a team of people, I hired six people all at the same time about a year ago. And it's important just for that group of people to get to know each other, to sort of onboard themselves to the group. And so we spent a lot of time just, you know, getting to know each other. Like our question for the team last week was, what was your first car? It has nothing to do with the work at hand, but everything to do with understanding where people come from and where their shared lived experience is. 
Um, I also think it's um, vitally important um, to really just have that accountability uh, with each other, setting good boundaries and ground rules. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how are we going to work as a team? What's our work plan? What's our, how are we going to measure ourselves? And, and then also holding each other accountable for that. And what does that look like? And so, you know, that's a, an important piece is if someone, you know, is going in a direction that doesn't make sense for the team, the organization, the community. Um, early in my career, I wasn't as good at holding people accountable for that and saying, hey, let's, you know, get back on track or this is a little bit out of the line with my expectations. Now I'm much more comfortable going ahead and doing that. And, and, and everybody appreciates that. Everyone wants to know where they're at, where they stand, what they're doing well, where they have the opportunities to improve. So uh, I, then, Mike, I, I didn't answer your question on the council piece of it. So you, you had asked a little bit about the council staff relationship. I think it's important for that piece of it is everybody needs to understand their role. The council, you know, gets to occupy the, the big part of the circle on policy. They're there to provide a policy vision for the city. The staff should, you know, have a big um, appreciation and understanding for where the administration of that policy lies. And that's their strong suit. You know, they live that. They have awareness of sort of the day-to-day the -day and how to make the policy happen. Then there's a crossover between that. And, and that's that space where, you know, both the council and staff live in together. But if people don't understand their, their boundaries there, if the staff wants to drive policy or the council wants to drive administration, that's a recipe for, um, you know, that, that's a, a recipe for, you know, not being successful. Um, so it, it's really unimportant for people to know their roles there. And I'd also just say that um, one of the things that's important for any board, whether it's a council, your company board, is to know that um, you speak as a group of people. Um, it's not about one person when you're on a board, it's about the collective voice of the board. And that's how you know, that has to translate into the policy as opposed to it being focused on one particular individual. Excellent. So uh, I, I really think we have to ask after the previous, uh, previous question, what was your first car, Aaron? You know, it was a horrible car. It was a 19, like 81 Toyota Celica that I had to drive with the heat on in order for it to work right. So it didn't last so long and it was always hot. Well, that's... <laughs> That's good to know. A, a, a Toyota Celica, huh? 80, nope. what year did you say? 81? Like 1981 or something, yeah. <laughs> so it had, a sweet, uh, it had a sweet moonroof though, so it was good that way. Well, that's, uh, that is very good. So uh, with, with uh, uh, how, do you, how do you go about setting the expectations uh, for your team? So you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, value-based expectations off of what the council provides, but how do you go about kind of moving that into the specifics of what your team is trying to accomplish? Yeah, no, I, and I think, you know, that's something we're very much um, working on right now. I mean, our council has laid out a vision, they've laid out strategic priorities, and our next move really is to then translate that into a strategic plan for all of our departments. Um, and, and really then putting a work plan to that, that has measurement. Um, so we understand like, if we're trying to, you know, just use a really, a, a really um, small example, you know, remove snow within all of our streets within eight hours, you know, that's our, that's our, that's a goal, but then we have to measure, you know, how often, you know, we're successful in, in accomplishing that. So we're really focused on getting to that next level of work planning and detail. Um, I think the process for developing that oftentimes is as important as the outcome and product, just so um, both the council and your team are bought in to, you know, what everybody's going to be working on and people feel like they've had um, say into the process, um, you know, and it really gets into more of a leadership conversation. You know, you can lead through collaboration and teamwork and, and trying to create shared vision. Um, and a lot of times where people don't succeed is when you're leading through intimidation, um, command and control, and um, you can get 
uh, certain places with that, um, but it's not going to take you ultimately, you know, anywhere long term or where you want to go in, in the long term. That's great insight, Aaron, uh, because I think a lot of times when people think of leaders, uh, they maybe think of that top down leadership structure as opposed to the more collaborative leadership structure. So it's great to kind of provide that extra little bit of insight to uh, these students. Uh, so, you know, as we're as we're kind of wrapping up here, why don't you talk about a little bit about what your average day looks like. I know you talked before about the fact that you have a variety of different things on your plate. So your average day perhaps isn't so average, but on an average day for you, what does it, what does that look like? Yeah. You know, so I'll just tell you like what my day to day is looking like because you know, it's varied, but you could replicate it through the week. And every one of those is going to look a little bit different. But, you know, I started off this morning um, relatively early talking about um, what are we going to do if we have too many teammates out with COVID-19 or quarantining as a result of that? We currently have one department that has over 10% of their workforce out um, or quarantining with that, much like folks in, uh, in schools are dealing with right now. And so we, because we provide essential services, if you flush your toilet, it's got to go somewhere. and We need to take care of that. If you call all the police, they need to show up. And so if it snows, we need the, you know, the, the streets uh, clear of snow. So we do a lot of what we call continuity of operations planning to make sure that we can provide those services no matter what's thrown at us. Um, so I, we started the day off talking about that. I switched into working on affordable housing because um, we have a big presentation in about an hour to the city council on affordable housing. And it's important for us as a community to be thinking about that. Um, I worked on uh, a partnership with the Mayo Clinic that we're working on to develop a rapid transit line in Rochester. It's about $114 million uh, project where we're seeking federal funds, um, but we're working with the clinic on the endpoint location. So I do a lot of work in construction and real estate related items to help make projects come together. Um, so a big part of what I do um, and de with development relates to real estate, as well as securing funding. Um, tracking the legislative activity today because the bonding bill is actively being discussed. We have an $11 million appropriation there for our airport project, which Mike, I know you are aware of, and another two and a half million dollars um, for our Cascade Lake um, project to really create a, you know, a better experience and more park improvements in that area. So I work a lot with construction, acquiring resources to do our projects, supporting the advocacy efforts behind those. Um, also um, spending time today on little stuff. We have a, like an office remodeling going on here. And so just figuring out, you know, how that's all going with the contractors on site. And we're actually um, spent time today working on a warming center or a day center uh, for folks experiencing homelessness. So they have a place to go during the pandemic out at our Silver Lake fire station. So. I can get all across the board on things. Um, I work with people that are supporting all those initiatives, providing feedback and walking through. I do a lot of troubleshooting. So if one of my people on my teammates, you know, runs into a snag, um, it's my, you know, part of my job is to help clear the path a little bit and, and solve through issues. So I, I do a lot of that. Um, the fun thing for me is it's, it's missional work. I'm passionate about it. I never feel like I'm going to work. And I think that's what people should always strive for is to find that space in life where it doesn't feel like you're working. It feels like you're serving. And, um, and I just admit, I know one of the questions that you have, and I'll just address it because when I was in school, I was always interested in this too. Um, you can make a good living doing this. You know, it's not as if, um, you know, you're, you're doing public service. Um, there's a great pension to help with your long-term financial security. There's great health insurance benefits. Um, you're never going to become independently wealthy, um, but at the same time, I will say um, we have uh, folks working for the city of Rochester that make around $180,000 a year, um, and it's all public. I'm one of those people. Um, our city administrator makes $191,000 a year, as well as our director of public utilities. They make, you know, in that space, our finance director, public works director. I mean, so they 
you, you can be highly compensated for executive level leadership roles in local government. Um, you will live comfortably, um, and, you know, if you manage your money well. And at the same time, you can do good missional work. Um, and, and again, we have many roles. Uh, it's not, you know, obviously I'm talking about my role today, but there's many roles for people that are interested in local government. Um, no matter what your interests are, there, there is a place for you here. Excellent. So uh, let's talk a, a little bit about what soft skills are necessary, not just in your specific job, but kind of across the board in the city of Rochester. Uh, what's necessary as uh, to get a job in local government? Yeah, Mike, I, you know, I think uh, for a while, government was very focused on hiring for technical skills. You know, how much education do you have? How much experience do you have doing A, B, or C? Do you have experience, you know, on this particular item, very specific? And as we know, as the economy has evolved, you know, things change so quickly, you really have to have those soft skills. And so I would just say the best thing you can do is learn to be a learner. I mean, I'm learning different things every day, and it's important in order for me to, you know, stay on, you know, the cutting edge of, of thought leadership in my profession. So um, you're always learning, it never stops. So just a passion for learning is important. Um, and then I think it's, it's those things that you also would expect. I mean, obviously, you have to be someone that people can count on. You have to um, have the ability to communicate effectively, um, and particularly orally. We do a lot of public presentations, particularly in my space, but you also have to be able to work interpersonally, one-on-one. -on -one. We have many people, you know, we are a very large complex service organization and part of providing those services, being able to work one-on-one -on -one with people to listen more than you talk, to understand, to have empathy. Um, those are all so important in order for you to be successful and pretty much no matter what you're gonna do in the long term. Um, and then writing skills. I mean, you know, I, I, I know the struggle can be real on getting through some of those English classes, but uh, writing and effectively writing in a way that is now digestible to people. Um, one of the biggest struggles I have with people on our teams is they wanna give, you know, 10 page treatises on whatever it is they're doing. And I have to remind folks, you know, people don't digest information like that. You know, we need to get to the top five bullet points. And so to be an effective, concise communicator is very, very important. Excellent. So uh, to wrap up here, uh, if people wanted to get in touch with you, what would be a good way for them to do it? And, uh, I guess that's that's a big question. What would uh, what would a good way for people to get in contact with you be? Yeah, so I'm I'm super happy to um, either you know connect with people that are interested in local government or find someone you know that I can connect you with that you know might help you to better understand what your interest might be. So uh, the best way to get a hold of me is uh, email um, a p a r r i s h so a parish at rochestermn.gov. That's my email. That's the number one, you know, best way for me to, for me to connect with folks. And then if I can help you, love to do that. Um, always interested in uh, helping folks to, to learn more about city government. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. I know you are an incredibly busy man. And uh, I know that you have a meeting that is very important coming up in about 36 minutes. So I appreciate it very much. This was helpful information for everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Mike. Uh, always great to catch up with you. Best, uh, best wishes to you and to all the students that are um, thinking about what their future might hold. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Same to you.